There are over 17,500 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you behind the scenes at America's top museums. Today we're at the John G. Shedd Aquarium, located on Chicago's beautiful lakefront. It's one of the world's largest indoor aquariums, welcoming two million guests every year. Since opening its doors in 1930, it has become home to over 32,000 aquatic animals, from sharks and stingrays to whales and snails. We're going to begin in the spectacular Oceanarium, home to dolphins and beluga whales. Then we'll get a behind the scenes peek at a special beluga whales training session. And we'll visit the on-site animal hospital. Then we'll take a peek into the aquarium kitchen that prepares food for all 32,000 residents and learn about some exciting new projects involving the aquarium's 3D printer, prosthetics, and one lucky lizard. We have a full day ahead of us, so let's dive in. Mick, thank you so much for letting us come to the Oceanarium today. Of course, today. it's great to have you here. What a great space. I, it is, isn't it? So who lives here, tell me. Who lives here? So we have Pacific white-sided they're dolphins. Calling. They're actually answering right now. They are? <laughs> Pacific white-sided dolphins, okay. beluga whales, penguins, sea lions, and sea otters. And they're all in here happily living together. They're all here. That is incredible. Now, it looks like, I mean, this is a huge space, obviously, right on Chicago's lakefront. Are there shows that go on here, or? There are, so we have the One World Aquatic Performance that goes on every day, multiple times a day, and it's a great time for our trainers to show all the natural behaviors that our animals learn here and show how the trainers interact and bond with the animals. So are the animals familiar with the specific trainers, or can they just pretty much train with anyone? All of our marine mammals trainers interact pretty much with all the different animals. Some of them have specialties, but during the performance, you'll see them work with a wide variety of, of different uh, dolphins or belugas. So I saw a Caribbean reef when I came in the front door. Tell me about that exhibit. So Caribbean reef has been thrilling people for decades. It was actually built in the 1970s. So there's a lot of different species in that habitat, from uh, stingrays to different types of tropical fish. Mm. Well, I thought I spotted a diver in there. Was that something that happens daily, or what is that? So our divers regularly do chats. Uh, as they dive and they feed the animals, they actually interact with the public outside. We have them on a microphone, so people outside can ask questions about the animals inside and really make a connection with that animal and with that diver who's really familiar with all the species that are in there. So what else is near the Caribbean reef? Amazon Rising is a really, really great one. We have uh, an enormous python in there. Uh, we have various types of uh, aquatic fish that are native to the Amazon, like the giant arapaima. Below street level, uh, lower, and one of the newer parts of Shedd Aquarium is Wild Reef. Now, Wild Reef is really great because all the habitats in there mimic uh, the reefs that are found in the Philippines. What's really cool is you can see multiple species of sharks, from sand sharks to uh, bamboo sharks. They're all in this gigantic habitat that's curved 12 feet of glass uh, that kind of mimics a diver's eye view as if they're looking around. And looking at it, you can see all these different species swimming together um, that and they are- they all cohabitate. They all do. It's such an exciting aquarium, and I know it's one of the world's largest, and mm -hmm. I know there's lots to explore that we're not even touching on, but mm -hmm. I know we are gonna get a little behind the scenes tour, so. Are you ready? Thank you, let's go. All let's, right. Let's dive in, as they I say. I think that sounds great. All right, here we go. All right. So Mick, we're still in the Oceanarium, right? But I know we've got a special treat, a, uh, Enrichment session, do you call it, for the beluga whales? We do. Actually, right now, we're about to see an enrichment session that's done by our trainers. It's a regular part of their daily activities where our trainers have a time to bond with them, um, to see them do certain behaviors, and kind of check them up to make sure they're healthy and uh, thriving. And um, so we're about to see what's, uh, what's going to happen. And how did the beluga whales know that these sessions are starting? Are they kind of brought over from a certain part of the tank? Or so they, they actually have a certain shape that the trainers will hold up. It's a different color and a different shape, and the animals recognize that and know it's time to start the enrichment. Um, it's almost like their name tag. Oh, isn't that interesting? Well, I can't wait to do this. So thank you so much for giving us this, this peek. No problem. Let's check it out.
Springtime means pebbles, sticks, and a chance for baby chicks. Yep, springtime for penguins means nesting season has arrived. As the penguins prepare to pair up, the animal care team places sticks and pebbles into their habitat and they begin to collect materials to arrange their nests. Feeding over 32,000 residents is quite an undertaking. Food prep begins each day at 5 a.m. with over 750 pounds of fresh fish to prepare. Interns arrive at 6.30 a.m. to begin going through every item looking for any imperfections. If they find any, it's composted to reduce waste. These marine mammals get the best of the best in their diet. The sea otters present a special challenge. It costs the aquarium more to feed the sea otters than the beluga whales, white-sided dolphins, California sea lions, birds of prey, dogs, and penguins combined. They have no blubber on their bodies, so their thick coats and high metabolism help keep them warm along with a lot of fresh seafood. They enjoy a mixture of clams, pollock, squid, and shrimp four times a day. One otter can eat almost 10 pounds of seafood every day, excluding treats like krill cubes and formula treats, plus shellfish and crabs once a week. When baby sea otters are raised at the Shedd Aquarium, they are fed a clam water formula every few hours to keep them warm and nourished. The next phase begins at five to eight weeks when very small pieces of seafood are introduced to their diet. At six to nine months, they graduate to solid food. Let's see, top quality seafood four times a day? Sounds good to me. Dr. Karen, thank you so much oh, for letting us pleasure. come down to this my sneak pleasure. peek of the animal hospital. This is so cool. It is very cool, and, and actually, this is kind of my dream job, so I think it's cool, I too. It, I bet it's a lot of people's dream jobs. Well, it is. I mean, this is the kind of job you come to work, and you learn something new every day, and that's what keeps that it I really believe. exciting. Now, tell, us, tell me, what are we looking at here? So this is... It's fairly similar to what you'd see at a, you know, if you took your dog to a vet mm -hmm. and there's a veterinary hospital, you're going to see equipment like monitoring equipment, Doppler, where we might get heart rates. Um, that's a multifunction monitor where we may get information about blood pressure. And then the machine next to it is a ultrasound. That's actually really important. We use that for a lot. A lot of people know ultrasound as like sonography. Sure. So when a, woman, a woman's pregnant and you're checking on the baby, we do the same thing with that when our dolphins or our whales are pregnant. And what we can do is that machine actually pops right off of the of the cradle it's on. We take it tank side and scan them right next to the Oh, thing. that's wonderful. And the nice thing is they're in water, so we don't need to use any goo. So you so. don't necessarily have to bring some of the larger aquatic animals into this yes. area. It would you be can... kind of hard to move a beluga yeah, into a hospital. I was looking at those whales thinking, yeah. what do you do if there's so an issue? Yeah. We do quite a lot of house calls, actually. So um, we, you know, all of our equipment's portable. So I'd say about 50% of the exams we do, we'll do up here in the hospital. The other 50 will actually go to them in their enclosure. Um, so for example, if we're doing a shark exam, we're not gonna bring the shark up here. We'll go down to the shark. Um, and we can do the exams either awake, depending on the species, or some of them we may gently sedate so we can take blood, look in their mouth, take x-rays if needed, and basically do the whole nine yards for the physicals. I also think being one of the world's largest aquariums, you must run into procedures that you need to do that maybe haven't been done before, or are you sharing information with other aquariums? Yeah, that's or? an excellent point you make. So, you know, I, I, we often joke in veterinary medicine that doctors kind of have it easy because they only have to know one species. That's true. For, for <laughs> us, I mean, you think about shed, we've got, you know, over 1,500 species. Oh, my gosh. So I, I think, you know, you learn a lot by your colleagues, by doing, and you have to share that material. So, Dr. Karen, what is this here that we're looking at? So we're looking right now at an x-ray, or we call a radiograph, of a California moray eel. And I'll give, I'll, you know, I'll teach you how to read an X-ray. X-ray 101. Oh, good. Okay. So head of the animals to your left, tails to your right, and this is their spine. And then what the Aquarius noticed is that there was this mass around the belly of this animal that it saw sticking out, 
but it wasn't associated with it eating. And so it said, hey doc, can you come check this out? And so sure enough, we saw this mass. We did an ultrasound where, or sonogram, and it was consistent with the mass in the stomach. We did x-rays, and then we even took a biopsy. And unfortunately, the biopsy came back as cancer, pretty oh. significant cancer. Mm. And so the election was made to go ahead and take this animal to surgery. I'm gonna scroll through just to show you. Ooh. This is actually after the surgery. Um, so the animal was taken to surgery and we actually had to resect the stomach or take the stomach out and then put the ends back together so the animal could eat after yeah. the surgery. You can see right here the animal is asleep and we actually don't do surgery underwater because if you did surgery underwater, tank water would go inside their body and they're not filled with tank water. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we sedate them in water with some powdered anesthetic then we take them out and then we put this tube in their mouth and then that keeps the water flowing over their gills while they stay asleep for the surgery. Oh my god. And the surgery lasted about three and a half hours. It was a long time. And you're monitoring anesthesia we while are. there, you're monitoring everything. We can wow. monitor their heart rate, we monitor their respiratory rate, we can take blood samples during the procedure if we need to. Mm. Um, I think I have a couple more pictures I can scroll to just showing Whoa. That's a snake. Whoa. Not a so here's kind of a close up. So, this is how the animal is laid out during surgery on her back in a little trough. These little tubes are helping her breathe. And then we do the surgery. And here's a close up of that tube in her mouth, which flows the gills over. I see. Now, if a dog or cat or a person was having surgery, the doctor would cover them with sterile cloth drapes. But we can't use cloth on fish because it abrades their skin. They have a protective mucus. So instead, we use sterile plastic sheeting. It does the same thing, but it keeps them nice and moist, and it keeps them at the appropriate temperature, and then we can work with them without hurting their skin. So here we're doing a voluntary ultrasound or sonogram of a pregnant beluga whale. Oh. And so the nice thing is these animals are trained to sort of come over to the edge of the pool, and we can take this nice little portable ultrasound machine and get down, and we're wearing boots, and scan them. The cool thing is you don't need any gooey gel because they're in water. Oh yeah. Um, and it's really nice. And again, this is all voluntary. So the animal will just lay out and you can see them. They have really good relationship with their Do they trainers. get really huge when they're pregnant? Like They do. You they can do. see it. Oh yeah. Wow. This is a, um, one of our ultrasounds showing the little fin of the baby when it's inside the, mommy, oh. <laughs> inside the mommy's uterus. And then here is a picture showing a birth happening. Uh, this is one of our Pacific white-sided dolphins. And you can see that the tails come out first, oh. and that's completely normal. And we want that to come out first so the tail can get a chance to kind of stiffen up in the water, because that's really going to be their paddle to sure. get up to breathe, because their air breathe is just like us. Is very, very important. Today, Maverick, the Fly River Turtle, is getting his yearly exam. The staff starts at the front and works their way back, beginning with the eyes and nose. By the way, the Fly River Turtle is also known as the Pig Nose Turtle. Maverick also gets his skin checked. His flippers are unique. The Flying River Turtle is the only freshwater turtle in the world with flippers. They can literally fly through the water. They check his back legs, digits, and joints to be sure everything looks great. They also check inside the shell looking for masses, tumors, and eggs in female turtles. If you wonder how you can tell the males from the female turtles, look at their tails. Males have a longer, fatter tail. Most turtles in the wild have hard shells. So do the Flying River turtles, but theirs is underneath the leathery skin on top. The vet looks for any swelling or missing skin. They also check underneath. This area is called the plaquestron. Looks good. They listen to his heartbeat with a Doppler ultrasonic probe. Three, two, seven, seven. Next up, the weigh-in. Even x-rays and measurements are taken.
Well, Maverick passed his physical exam today with flying colors, so he's heading back with a clean bill of health. So Wade, we're in this teen center. Tell me about this. Yeah, so this is a space that we uh, opened in September of 2013. Um, and it's a, a, it's a pilot space. Uh, so we're working out, trying to figure out what it's gonna be like. But the whole point of it is so that we can have teens drive everything that goes on in this space. So it's built for them, it's built by them. They picked out the furniture, they picked out the colors, the technology, um, and they drive the curriculum. So we don't have a traditional curriculum or a map of what the activities are in the lab. It's really based on teens dropping in, telling us what they want to work on and what projects they're interested in. But most of them are involved with biology or animal behavior. I mean, what? Yeah. Or just different backgrounds. Every, everything. Everything. Yeah. So all we, of the above. We right? cross um, your traditional stuff where they want to be a marine biologist or the dolphin trainer, right? But we yeah. also have folks who come here with a background in art or an interest in uh, the natural world that's not always marine science. So, And we try to hybrid that. So we, we, we have them working on activities that might be a little bit more art oriented. So they're 3D printing or they're doing watercolor painting. Oh, but when they're watercolor painting, they might be looking at macroinvertebrates under a microscope and painting sure. those things. Instead of a so, landscape or whatever. Right, yeah. So they get, they get that kind of mix. And so even if they're passionate, they want to be a graphic designer someday, um, they can grow up and, and go through the teen lab and use the, the mission of Shedd Aquarium or the natural world as like their inspiration for doing that. Do they get to go upstairs too? Or? Yeah, so we, we always have projects going on that they can connect to upstairs. And so it's free to come to the teen lab and whenever they've got a project, it's free. It's free. Yep. Wow. Yep. Where was this when I was a kid? <laughs> I would have loved we, this. We get that a lot actually. Yeah. I so, bet. <laughs> um, so yeah, so they come to the teen lab and they get to work on a project here with us and if they were requires something upstairs, we take them upstairs and we, we work with uh, you know the exhibit design team or the fishes team or whoever is uh, working on the exhibit they're interested in and connect them that. that. Just to imagine if you have even a, a smidgen of interest in the sciences, mm -hmm. to be able to come to a place like this just opens up your whole world yeah, to all these different careers. Right, yeah, and actually one of the cool things is that we have mentors from every department in the building oh. who spend time in the lab and work on actual their day-to-day -day work in the lab. So they, they come in, they don't even leave workshops, they come in and bring their real work, their authentic challenges, and they spend time in the lab getting feedback from teens and really getting to that where the teen can say, hey, can I help? Like, how yeah. do I get to do what you're doing? Yeah, um, absolutely. And really connect to them that way. And that's every department. We're talking our technology team, graphic designers, our uh, marine mammal team, animal trainers, all those folks from every department in the building so that teens get to see that, yeah, there's marine biology, there's dolphin training, but there's all these other careers in the, in the world uh, of the aquarium as well. Thank you so much for talking with us today about this great, the Teen Center and your 3D printer project. Yes. I know that you were head of, uh, the head of a very interesting project for one lucky, it was a lizard, right? It's a lizard, it came in lizard. Yes. What happened? Well, actually, um, I don't know the, all the details on it, but it turned out that during a routine medical exam, they found that the lizard had a, what looked like a tumor on his right foot, Ooh. his right back foot. And it turned out after doing some further testing that it was cancer. Mm. And unfortunately, to, in order to play it safe and keep him as healthy as possible, they had to make the decision to amputate the right back foot. Okay. So, and yeah, now that, what? So, so I mean, now, so I guess yeah. the decision is what do we do? Do we have this poor lizard living without right, the foot? Right, or? right. So it turns out um, after he healed from the surgery, it seemed like he was getting along just fine. Not, you know, not perfect, not he's sort of adapting to his situation, but what a vet tech and some other vets decided that why don't we explore the possibility of making a prosthetic foot for him? so that he can walk a little more normally, keep his hips a little more even. Enter and Kristen. Just to see if yeah. Could, yeah, improve his life a little bit. So, sure. Yeah. So what would the first step be? I see you've got this great visual right. here. So um, what, we wanted to, what we wanted to do is make a copy of the foot that he has. In the order, good foot. Yeah, the good mm -hmm. foot in order to replace the missing foot. Um, and without that right foot anatomy, we needed to employ some technology in order to um, get the anatomy correct and be able to um, create a at least possibly a lifelike 
replica of his right foot. Well, now this is not something that was normally in your uh, wheelhouse, was it? I mean, you're doing exhibits and other no, things, right. but, well, but what a fun challenge. Right, we do a lot of model making, and so we do replicate uh, whole animals, usually in order to do like um, exhibit elements. We do copying of starfish and different kinds of animals, just so we can have plastic models of them to illustrate things that a person wouldn't be able to touch here at the aquarium, but um, something that they could look at and feel and get close up to without touching the real thing. So here's the 3D printer, right? Yes. yes. Is this the actual prosthetic, Kristen? Um, this is actually a, a prototype that we printed, and it has the correct anatomy of the right foot. Um, so actually, it's made out of plastic that's, uh-oh, oh, Just strong. lost a toe. Uh, right. Great. Hence the <laughs> prototype. Yeah. Yes. But, actually, but it's hard, right? It's, I mean, hard, you were it's hard plastic, right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so this foot is the right size. We did. We measured it by millimeters and everything. And in the end, what we'll do is take different materials and modify that further, um, making a mold of that, and then using a whole lot of different materials to test because we're not sure exactly what'll work best sure. for the animal, for the environment that he's well, walking it's around. Well, it's an experiment, in. yeah. It's an experiment. So the information comes from the printer, that, I mean, from the computer that right. we were just looking at, and then right. it feeds into this mm -hmm. system. Right. And then how does this actually? So right, Come so the be. simple version of how a 3D printer works is that a, a spool of plastic wire is actually fed through an extruder, which is heated up to 230 degrees roughly, and it's it actually traces a path that the computer tells it to, um, and makes the object in three dimensions. So it starts to layer it up from the bottom. From it the starts. bottom, right? So it's additive manufacturing is what it's called. So mm -hmm. yeah, so from the bottom up, it'll. This is the last row is right there at the tippy top. And how so, long does something like this size take? This one was probably about 45 minutes. Wow. So, yeah, there's there's And then you a could have a spool with different materials in it, but no or no, that would always be right. the material. Right. Ideally, for this machine it only uses one type of plastic. Okay. But there are other machines in the world that can do pretty much anything including live human material. They can they've started to try to 3D print um, organs and kind of like the sky's the limit with that. So they'd be much bigger units. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Tell me a little bit about how the fitting is going. I know it's not actually on the lizard yet. Are you anticipating right, soon? Right, right. We've, we've tried it on them a few times just Good. to see if it works and just to make sure we have the right um, shape and the right angle to make sure that it, he can actually walk with it. So a few times he's kicked it off because he just, well, it just new. didn't work. It's a sure. new thing. Yeah, so we're thinking we're getting really close to something he could wear for a certain amount of time. We're not really sure yet. But what fun yeah. that will be though, the yeah, first time you see exciting. him actually walking on it. So yes. we'll have to come back for that. Okay, yeah, definitely. What a great trip to the John G. Shedd Aquarium today. Getting a chance to go behind the scenes with the Beluga Whales, the Veterinary Hospital, the Food Kitchen, the Teen Learning Center, and learning about the 3D printing process really was an adventure. So don't miss the chance to come explore the aquarium next time you're in Chicago. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure.